Pathfinder Adventure. We're a party of four. There's a supporting character played by the DM, who's a catfolk ninja, who talks in a babyish cat voice. I don't know how to explain. His name is Nyanamin, also. For context, I play an undying war priest, Nyanamin. So you have to go into that temple, but look out for dangers. Me, out of character. Dangerous. Purrs. Are you making fun of me? You stupid fish. How dare you? Go back to your stupid sea. I'll make some sushi out of you. Yeah. Also, he'll start calling me fish instead of my character's name. Mary. Me. Wait, I was out of character. My DM. I know. Now Nyanaman says you're racist. Me. How am I the racist one here? I don't know, man. You messed up. You targeted the most oppressed minority of them all. Cat girls. I am a cat. A kitty kitty cat. I am a cat. A kitty kitty cat. I eat fish and lick my groin. Khajiit has wares if you have coin. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch. In today's story, we have just about everything. Cat girls, cringy long-distance friends you met on World of Warcraft, and in-game romances that strain on real-life ones. All of which surrounds a player who, while not quite a problem player himself, becomes a magnet for cringe. Today I present to you the tale of Loverboy XXX and Jane, the problem player and Loverboy's femme fatale. So without further ado, let's dive right into Baron's chat and get right into this story. I'll start off by giving you all some context. I've always been interested in the storytelling aspects of RPGs. However, I haven't had the greatest of experiences when trying to get into traditional TTRPGs like Dungeons and Dragons and the like. Stories for another time. This is long enough as it is. So, around seven or eight years ago while I was still in high school, some friends I met through World of Warcraft suggested that I could GM, if you could even call it that, a sort of choose-your-own-adventure-style session for them that was primarily focused on plot and roleplay. The actual mechanics were very simplistic, and pretty much only there to settle the occasional dispute, since the purpose of the whole thing was a sort of collaborative writing adventure, where the main focus was to tell a story with me acting as the story's narrator, to this day, I'm not sure whether they came up with the concept on their own, or if this style of play has an official name. They literally just called it a narrative RPG. I'm sure the more experienced among you can tell me whether that's a thing or not. Every time I read something like this, I just cry knowing that PBTA exists. And if they could just look away from Dungeons & Dragons for just one second, they could find it. <clears throat> anyway, back to the story. I have never been much of a role player, but I am, I'd like to think, a passable writer, oh, we all think that, especially considering that English isn't my first language. So, in spite of my reluctance, I eventually agreed to create a narrative for their characters. Given the rules-light nature of the game, a lot of the restrictions had to be enforced by the lore, and just general common sense. But I rarely had anyone going into business for themselves, so doing so would have been counterintuitive to everyone's enjoyment. There were ways to get your character killed if you really wanted to, sure, but I had no incentive to deliberately stifle anyone, nor did the players have any reason to go out of their way to pick fights they couldn't win. Overall, it was a surprisingly fun time, and gave me a chance to flex my creative muscles. I started putting more and more effort into the world, crafting stories and adventures my players could choose to partake in, with different outcomes depending on their actions, or inactions. That is, until a player I'll just refer to as Jane came along. Jane started as a new and pretty active member of the World of Warcraft guild my friends and I were a part of. She and one of said friends, henceforth referred to as Loverboy XXX, because he will read this and I'm feeling petty, had apparently grown close and were all up in each other's DMs. Nothing wrong with that. At some point, he had even told her about the group's weekly online sessions and invited her to join. I was officially introduced to Jane via voice chat, and I gave her a rundown of the setting, the current campaign's progress, 
and the general guidelines for designing her character. She seemed pretty receptive to it all, and was eager to join in on the party's adventures. Even going the extra mile by making her first character my world's equivalent of a healer, so that the party, who were a tight-knit band of former cutthroats, had an incentive to bring her along. It created an interesting dynamic, where Jane's sheltered character grew accustomed to the world at the same rate she did, bringing some much-needed contrast to the party's composition. If I absolutely had to nitpick, I'd say that she liked playing the role of the damsel in distress, a bit too often for my liking. But no one else seemed to mind, so I refrained from commenting on it at this time. Without going into too much detail, the setting was a blend between traditional fantasy, Egyptian mythology, and Turkish folklore, where the party often had to leave the safety of the capital and venture into the untamed desert in search of long-forgotten tombs, treasure, and the like. Following the party's decision to side with the guards during an uprising, they were invited to the palace, where they were to meet and be congratulated by the royal family themselves for playing a pivotal role in subduing the rebellion. Pleasantries were exchanged, and meaningless titles were granted, before the party were sent back off to their base in the slums. If that sounds underwhelming, it's because that was the point. I was trying to establish how detached the nobles were from the plight of their subjects. Despite all of my efforts to write them as condescending ducks, one of the members of the royal family, who I'll just refer to as the prince, for simplicity's sake, seemed to have left an impression on Jane's character. To clarify, the prince was the youngest of the king's sons, and the embodiment of narcissism. I wrote him to be as douchey and elitist as possible, which made the healer's sudden crush on him all the more baffling. I don't know, OP. The prince sounds like a real Sigma male. Hates women. Hates the poor. Sigma male grind set. Yes, I described him as very physically attractive, but that was literally his only redeeming quality. And there was no shortage of traditionally attractive NPCs and player characters surrounding her constantly, if she really wanted to go down that route. That said, Jane's character was meant to be naive, so I figured her swooning over a guy that despises everything she represents could have been used to highlight her inexperience. Unfortunately, it was nothing as self-aware as that. Both in character and out, Jane kept bringing the prince up, much to the party's annoyance. She insisted that they fully align themselves with the crown in hopes of earning more favor, while simultaneously asking me when they were going to be meeting him again. As you could probably guess, Loverboy XXX was particularly, and quite vocally, against this. For obvious reasons. Perhaps I should have been more stern in railroading them away from that entire plotline. But, in my defense, I was really committed to adapting to everyone's choices. Jane got her way eventually, dragging everyone along with her and forcing me to come up with more and more stuff they could do for the local gentry. I made a point of clearly telling her that their efforts were appreciated, but it wasn't getting them any closer to another audience with the prince. Keep in mind this was an NPC I hadn't put much thought into at the time, since I never expected him to be anything beyond an entitled prick whose entire purpose was to symbolize the blatant disconnect between the common man and the ruling class. I could have and eventually did flesh him out more, but at the time, nobody apart from Jane cared about him enough to justify doing that. Loverboy XXX was getting pretty fed up by Jane's infatuation with my NPC, and out of character demanded that we move on to something else. I explained that I've been presenting them with different plot hooks this entire time, but instead, they just kept catering to her healer's whims, who had pretty much assumed somewhat of a de facto leader role. If nothing else, the mental image of a ragtag group of hardened outlaws following around a teenage girl pursuing her crush was sort of amusing. Finally picking up on the group's frustrations, Jane relented, and we were allowed to move on to something else. It was at this point when Loverboy XXX's character started trying to get closer to Jane's, which, while awkward at times, at least made sense, since they had a thing in real life. Both of their characters were of similar age, 
and it didn't interfere with my storytelling. Jane was open-minded to the idea, but didn't seem particularly excited about it. Her healer and his cutthroat continued with their in-character flirting throughout several campaigns, but their relationship never evolved past the occasional innuendo or remark. All was well, until that fateful evening when I saw that Jane had messaged me several times on Skype. When I opened our conversation, I saw paragraph upon paragraph of her, I'm assuming in character, since most of it was surrounded by quotation marks, proclaiming her love for the prince, and straight up demanding to meet him again. It's been a long time, so I don't remember exactly what she said, but I distinctly remember her threatening to leave the friend group altogether if I didn't make it happen. She went on to guilt trip me, saying it would have been my fault if Loverboy XXX, I kid you not, oh my god, harmed himself over her leaving without a word. Since she apparently was helping him battle through some mental issues, none of us were aware of. I honestly had no idea how to react. I remember just sitting there, reading through her messages and trying to formulate some sort of adequate reply in my head. Eventually, I settled on the worst thing I could have probably done. I proposed to narrate a private, non-canon exchange between her healer and my NPC. Obviously, she agreed and was pretty enthusiastic about it, as though she hadn't just threatened my friend's mental health in order to get her way. I have no excuse for choosing to indulge her instead of immediately talking to Loverboy XXX about the whole thing. I guess I was both worried about him and scared of our friend group disbanding, which eventually happened anyway, but over an unrelated incident. Fast forward to the day of my private session with Jane, the scene opened with the prince standing on a balcony, overlooking the royal gardens, and her character being invited into his quarters. I obviously knew what she was after, so I made up some bullshit reason as to why he had taken a sudden interest in her. I don't remember what it was exactly. Both expressed their inexplicable infatuation with each other, and things obviously got heated. So I hurried to fade to black, only Jane wasn't having it. She was basically expecting me to ERP with her, something I had never done, and had no interest in doing. I explained to her that, at the time, I wasn't really interested in exploring sexual stuff, both in and out of character. Cue the prawn. That's right, folks. Jane seemed to have thought that all I needed was some inspiration. And so, in her infinite wisdom, she proceeded to spam me pictures and gifts of explicit acts she wanted my character to do to hers. Then she went on to make the whole thing ten times weirder by expressing how this sort of content was making her feel. Though both of us were 18 at the time, I still don't feel comfortable recounting her exact words verbatim. Let's just say that she was making me increasingly uncomfortable until she left me no choice but to tell her off, which she took about as well as you'd expect. She left the group soon after and blocked all of us, including Loverboy XXX, who took it hard, but got over it, after confiding in the rest of us instead. Not sure what Jane has been up to since then. I had seen her mentioned in passing a few times before our WoW guild got disbanded for good, since most of us moved on to other games and hobbies. Apparently, she is currently married, so I genuinely wish her all the best, and hope she has grown as a person since the above-mentioned incident. Only recently did me and Loverboy reconnect, who you can thank for reminding me about Jane and directing me to this subreddit. It's a mildly uncomfortable experience at best compared to the other stories I've read on here, but I thought it would still be worth sharing. Nothing like some good ERP to start off the tale. Jane sounds, well, awful. Disregarding Loverboy's feelings for a made-up relationship with a non-playable character. That's... That's pretty cringe, bro. You too can pick up a That's Pretty Cringe Bro mug at the Den of the Drake shop. Not sponsored. I can kind of sympathize with this idea of wanting to bring your World of Warcraft guildies in on your RPG game. I may or may not have roleplayed in World of Warcraft for several years. No, I didn't make a cringy night elf vampire. God, why did everyone do that? I'm gonna blame Twilight for that. When all else fails, blame Twilight. Besides, 
I couldn't make a cringy night elf vampire even if I wanted to, because I played Horde. Unfortunately for Loverboy, this won't be the first time he attracts problem players to his game. As unfortunately, the story continues with two new problem players. Since we had Den of the Drake on, I might as well take his format and combine both of these stories into one video. Don't worry, we'll keep it a secret. But if he finds out, just buy one of his mugs. So without further ado, let's ooh our last woos and dive right into this story. As I mentioned in the previous story, Loverboy XXX and I recently reconnected. Unlike myself, he never stopped being interested in RPGs, ever since our group fell apart years ago, and is now an avid Dungeons & Dragons player and occasional DM. Pertaining to the latter, some time ago he asked me to help him build a world of his own, since the people he regularly played with had expressed interest in a more narrative-driven campaign. This will be another lengthy one, so brace yourself as I regale you with the thrilling tale of Ben, the brooding brandisher of man breasts, and his accomplice, Cody, the cat girl connoisseur. It all began one gloomy Sunday evening. My dear friend, Loverboy XXX, invited me to a Discord call with his wayward band of eager adventurers. Since, let's face it, I will be the one doing most of the world building. I wanted to gather everyone's input as to what kind of story they were looking to experience. I already had a few settings in mind, but I figured that it might be a good idea to gauge the group's interests beforehand. I'd like to think that I have a knack for world building, hence why Loverboy XXX wanted to include me. But it tends to take me longer than most people to actually write all of my ideas down. Same! Partially due to English being my second language, and also other factors outside of my control that I don't feel like specifying. The point being that I didn't want to spend time developing a world nobody wants. Four of the five players were actually incredibly nice to me, and I quickly understood why Loverboy liked playing with these people. That is, with the exception of one. The aforementioned Ben, not his real name. See, while the rest of the group wanted a medieval high fantasy setting, Ben insisted on it being set in the modern world. Under the pretense that he was tired of, I quote, swords and dragons and shift. Now, don't get me wrong. Personally, I sort of get where he was coming from. But instead of respectfully voicing his opinion, he came across as a stubborn, petulant child that talked over anyone who suggested a compromise. Cody, also a made-up name, who is his brother, was initially on the majority's side, but was quickly pressured by Ben into changing his tune. For context, Everyone involved is in their early to late twenties. Was it not for Loverboy chiming in and telling them both to essentially shut the flock up and let everyone else talk, I would have left the call then and there. We eventually found a middle ground and settled on a story set in a fictional version of Victorian era London with elements of dark fantasy and eldritch horror a la Bloodborne. The group played a special unit of half-monster hybrids, who were artificially created for the sole purpose of hunting down other monsters. For example, the defanged were humans voluntarily afflicted with a heavily refined version of vampirism, which grants most of the benefits of being a full-blooded vampire, but makes it so they crave the blood of other afflicted creatures, ensuring that once their purpose is fulfilled, they'd essentially starve to death. I took everyone's suggestions and conceptualized several other races and factions that all follow a similar philosophy, then spent the following week compiling the world's lore while also keeping it loose enough so that Loverboy could easily fill the blanks in with his own ideas and then presented it to the group the following weekend. Almost everyone, including Ben, seemed happy with the result all that was left now was for Loverboy to integrate the actual game mechanics into the setting. Cody, however, wasn't completely sold on the idea yet. He was usually far meeker compared to his older brother, and only spoke his opinion if it echoed Ben's. Not this time. For you see, 
In my conviction to create a consistently gritty and oppressive atmosphere, I had neglected to account for something, a cornerstone of every successful role-playing game. But what about cat girls? Yeah. Anime, Anime was, was a mistake. mistake. So, yeah. To reiterate, Cody really, and I mean really, wanted to play as a cat girl. Not sure why he didn't say anything during the initial call, but regardless, now he was dead set on it. He hinted that he wouldn't participate if he couldn't be one. My friend was about to shoot the idea down and let Cody walk, and in hindsight I probably should have let him. But, being the diplomatic doormat that I am, I said that we could probably conceive something close to his ideal character that also fitted the setting. After all, we already had werewolves whose entire shtick was morphing only certain parts of their anatomy to get an edge in battle without going completely feral. It wasn't that far of a stretch, right? Oh yes it was. Behold the mother of all ass pulls, the Nikomata, a supernatural species loosely inspired by our world's yokai equivalent, entities and spirits in Japanese folklore. Unlike lycanthropes, the Nikomata started off as just normal cats that were changed into half-human hybrids through some sort of eastern occult magic. In addition to aesthetic traits, such as the obligatory cat ears and tail, they possess the weapons, senses, and agility of cats, with little to no drawbacks. However, if they are to stray even slightly from the edicts of their highly spiritual sect, they will be reverted back to regular animals. The concept wasn't great, but it was good enough. So far, you can probably tell that we were going for a sort of Suicide Squad kind of vibe. Ideally, it would have been up to the players to decide whether they wanted to blindly follow orders or to work together in order to find some sort of loophole in their design and turn on their handlers. All of this was, of course, discussed with the group, and they absolutely loved the idea. Even Cody was inspired, now that he could be his true weeby self. I've got no room to judge, considering that I was the one who made it possible. From here on out, my involvement in the campaign's progress was negligible, so most of what I'm about to tell you is from my friend's perspective, as the DM. I have no reason to doubt him, but I figured that I should mention that for the sake of transparency. The party was gathered at an abandoned inn outside of town, where they were briefed by their handler regarding their upcoming mission. They were to hunt down a group of cultists, sulking around in the sewers, and stop them from summoning some sort of Lovecraftian creature with mind-altering abilities. They were given one in-game day to choose their equipment and prepare, aka establish their class and roleplay amongst themselves. Loverboy apparently wanted all of the introductions out of the way first, before the plot properly kicked in. Ben was playing a defanged male duelist named Maximilian with a tragic backstory, whom he described as tall, muscular, handsome, and, crucially, wearing a leather harness that emphasized his broad, bare chest. Already an odd thing to put so much emphasis on, but rest assured, it gets weirder. You know how some authors go to excessive lengths to describe a female character's chest, to the point where breasts are pretty much an extension of her personality and the focal point of every scene she's in. Yeah, that, only applied to a male character. While the rest of the group became acquainted, Maximilian stuck to the shadows, communicating only through grumbles and the occasional pectoral flex. My favorite quote has to be, The chest of Maximilian shines in a tempting way while he is waiting to be approached. When nobody took the bait, Ben made an out-of-character remark towards his brother, very heavily implying that Cody, who was actually doing an alright job fitting in with the rest of the crew, should have been paying more attention to him. Cody complied, which Ben interpreted as an invitation to pretty much assume control of his precious cat girl, describing how her eyes went wide when she noticed the sheen of Maximilian's smooth pecs. No, I am not making this shit up. 
For the sake of everyone who had to witness two brothers pretending to awkwardly flirt with each other, all the while, one of them was trying to do a squeaky schoolgirl voice. Loverboy decided that it was quite enough bonding for the time being, and moved the campaign along, skipping to the newly formed squad of misfits descending down into the sewers. Overall, the actual gameplay portion proceeded as it usually had. Everybody played their role competently, and after fighting their way past droves of minor abominations, reached the hidden chamber where the ritual was being conducted. They easily slaughtered the cultists before they could fully summon their patron deity, which was teased as the eventual endgame boss for chapter one of what was intended as a year-long campaign. Following the battle, Ben started to act as though his character was badly injured, despite him having sustained little to no damage during most of the encounters. He insisted that the group's physician, obviously another female character, look him over. Upon her begrudgingly inquiring about the injury, it was, of course, described in great detail as a large gash across Maximilian's strong, brawny, muscular, firm yet soft, rugged yet sensual, morally complex, character arc-defining, and suspiciously perky man-teats. I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. Only thing arching's gonna be this man's back. He's got those daddy Melkies, those big busty dilf bazongas. Every day is chest day for my mans over here. And when it's chest day, it ain't a rest day. He's got that, wasn't I reading a story or something? Oh, right. After a collective virtual eye roll by almost everyone involved, Maximilian was unceremoniously patched up and the group returned to their hideout for some downtime. It was Cody's turn in the limelight. With his older sibling still selling his character's injury, props for consistency at least, and retiring to his room, Cody was finally given the opportunity to shine. Remember how I mentioned how he attempted to do a stereotypical squeaky anime girl voice before? Well, my man decided to double down, and now exclusively spoke like that during every single interaction. Hey, cat girl, you want a drink? Yeah, only if it's milk. And, and don't forget to put it in a bowl. Ooh. I'm gonna regret doing that voice like 10 years down the line. I'm applying for some government job. And then someone's like, oh, didn't you have a YouTube channel? I remember this one time when you did a cat girl voice. All right, let's get this story over with. Yes, it was as cringeworthy as it reads. And yes, it clashed with the overall bleak aesthetic of the campaign. But having a fully grown man with a heavy Scottish accent trying to unironically sound cutesy was at least funny in an endearing sort of way. Unlike Ben, who was just plain obnoxious. Speaking of whom, he would still occasionally interject and remind everyone that Maximilian was now slowly changing into his casual clothes. But oops, he'd forgotten to lock his bedroom's door. How awkward would it be? if someone was to check up on him at the exact moment. Right, guys? <laughs> no one ever did, by the way. As the campaign went on, Ben continued to find ways of objectifying his beefcake. One of my favorite highlights is the time when Maximilian was briefly reunited with his estranged sister. Before going their separate ways, she had given him their dead mother's earrings as a parting, sentimental gift. Try and guess what he did with them. If you guessed, used them as nipple piercings, then congratulations, you've been paying attention. In a weird way, I sort of admire his commitment to the trope. All that said, I wouldn't be writing this if it wasn't for what happened during the campaign's climax, pun intended. Let's set the scene. In spite of the party's best efforts, the previously mentioned eldritch entity was finally summoned and unleashed upon the populace. Madness and bloodshed filled the streets. Our band of unlikely heroes had barricaded themselves at the abandoned inn, savoring their last moments of peace before having to confront the horrors that awaited beyond those walls. Everyone was gathered at the bar for one final shot of liquid courage. Suddenly, almost as if prompted to do so, our resident cat girl excused herself and scurried off to the back. 
She was gone for quite a while, and the rest were already at the door, prepared for a grueling gauntlet of increasingly challenging encounters. When asked what his character was doing, Cody refused to outright state, again, almost as if someone was telling him not to. Then, Maximilian undertook the initiative to go check on her, which was uncharacteristic in and of itself. It turned out that she had ran off to pleasure herself one final time, and was now caught in the middle of the act by our moody duelist, conveniently walking in on her. Upon being discovered, which was painfully staged, Cody went on to describe in great detail the exact pose he had found her in, along with the object she had been using as an improvised, uh, toy, the stock of a flintlock? That's gotta be painful, if you're curious. And no, I don't know why. Needless to say, everyone present was speechless. I mean, how do you prepare for something like that? The pair interpreted the stunned silence as encouragement. But, just as Ben was presumably about to join in on the fun, Loverboy promptly interrupted their scene. He announced that they'd be taking a break for an hour or two, during which he dragged both brothers in a private call and told them to keep stuff like that out of his game. Yes, the setting had some mature themes, but forcing everyone to listen as they graphically indulged each other's fetishes crossed more than a few lines. I'm not sure how I would have handled it personally. Maybe the more experienced DMs among you can share any similar experiences and how you've dealt with them. Thankfully, the story was allowed to conclude almost as intended. The big bad monster was defeated, and its surviving mind slaves liberated. Even if the group had failed to liberate themselves in the end, Ben quit the server soon after. Cody stuck around for a while longer, but eventually quit as well. Loverboy quickly found replacements, and they have been playing ever since. Some say that if you join voice chat at exactly 3am with your volume turned up, you can still hear the faint jingling of nipple rings. TLDR Two real-life brothers participate in a roleplay-heavy campaign. One plays a brooding vampire obsessed with his man tits, and the other, a stereotypical cat girl he insists on authentically voicing. They get increasingly weird with each other, until they get told off, and afterwards quit the server. Okay, this is why I say don't join a game horny. Look at this. This has got to be the most painful story I've ever had to suffer through. Why the man tits? Come on! Why do they have to glisten like he's Edward Cullen? Bella, look at me. This is the skin of a killer and the pectorals of a dilf. Oh my god, I'm scared and aroused at the same time. You know, I'd normally would like to throw in some nuggets of advice to try to help new DMs to stave off their problem players. I, I got nothing. How's this? Bring a stick whenever you DM a game so that you can just bonk the horny out of people. How's that for advice? Anyway, <laughs> I would first like to thank Den of the Drake for rolling his R's better than I ever could in the opening bit. And if you haven't already checked out his channel, w what are you doing? Go, watch his videos. Hell, you probably came from there. How's this? Buy one of his mugs. Tell him the burb sent you. Link to his channel will be in the description down below. I would also like to thank my sudden surge of patrons, of which I now have four of. Our Baron of Beaks, Anya, and our three new Counts of Quills, Netscape, Zero Fang, and Haley. Thank you all so, so much for your support. There's a poll going on right now on the Crow's Perch Patreon to help me make the decision on what kind of rewards I would be offering to patrons. So if you're planning on becoming a new patron to the Crow's Perch, this will probably be a good time, as we're making the decision of whether or not we're going to be doing merchandise first, or monthly games, and a couple of other ideas. But if you don't want to be a patron, it's perfectly fine. Just be sure to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. And for our Art of the Week this week, Novatonix has the final rendition of the five-man crew of Dice Goblins, featuring my character Kithmit alongside his compatriots, and also including Artificial DM himself floating within the realm of the Aether. Just look at this. Absolutely fantastic. If you would like to submit your own art, or just to view all the art from the people who are way more talented than me, feel free to join in on the Crow's Perch Discord channel. Some of them even live stream on here when they're doing their art. So be sure to catch that. Oh yeah, I also have a Twitter now. Link will also be in the description.
Send me memes. Good ones. And with all of that out of the way, I will see you next time. As the crow flies. <laughs>